Good morning. Uh, if you are joining us from the West Coast, like uh, the chair of our panel, Christine Pelieu and I, good afternoon if you are joining us from the East Coast, and good evening if you are joining us from Europe or um, uh, Turkey, Greece, uh, the former lands of the Ottoman Empire, anywhere over there. Um, let me first start by um, saying that it is difficult. It's a very difficult moment in Turkey and Syria after the earthquakes. And uh, we actually thought about maybe doing something on the earthquakes on this very day, rather than having this event, which we had planned earlier. But uh, none of the people whom we invited could really meet together on today. And so that's why we didn't change our plans. We have our event uh, going on, but we do have we do have uh, something planned uh, that we'll talk about the earthquake for next Friday. Uh, and if you uh, haven't received our messages yet, we do have a plea for support that you can reach in this web address where uh, we listed a number of uh, a number of organizations that collect donations. Uh, if I were to highlight two for the purpose of United States uh, Research Institute on Turkey, uh, a, a 501c3 uh, organization based in New York is collecting funds and they are transferring them to Ahbab. And then um, I could also cite Boyut, uh, Bo Bosphorus University's alumni uh, who are abroad. Uh, they are collecting money specifically for students, uh, university students, college students who are affected by the earthquake. Uh, as I said, we will have, uh, today we are here for room geographies, uh, but next Friday, we will have a Turkey Now session uh, that will focus on the earthquake Quake with uh, several participants uh, who will bring uh, different perspectives, their experiences, their knowledge uh, together. I hope you can join us. Now, I'm going to introduce to you uh, the chair of today's uh, panel, my colleague Christine Filiu, who teaches at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, everybody knows Christine, and she has actually chaired uh, uh, WhatsApp sessions in the past. Uh, I asked her to chair this one too because uh, the occasion is uh, something that she did for uh, the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, in our most recent issue, we had a special dossier, Room Geographies, that she edited with an introduction. Uh, and so she will tell you about uh, the dossier and the contributors to it. And um, just in case um, you um, are following Christine in Turkish. Uh, here I have uh, her two very well-known books and their Turkish translations too, uh, now both of them available. Uh, so now again, uh, it's time to start our panel Room Geographies with Christine. Christine, please uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Baki. Um, Thank you for inviting us to present this uh, special dossier to the OTSA community and for your and Heather Ferguson's and David Gutman's tireless support and encouragement through the process of uh, publication of this special dossier. Um, and of course, I wanna first thank the four authors of these contributions, only three of whom could be here today, unfortunately, um, but uh, I'd like to thank them for their research, all their efforts and their research and that went into publishing these articles. Um, so I'm not gonna say a lot, but I, you can, I, I welcome you to read the dossier and read the introduction. Um, I'm just going to, um, because, well, the authors and the, um, their contributions really speak for themselves and the authors will speak for themselves today. Um, so I just wanna preface the presentations with a very brief comment. Um, and that is just to call out the fact that each of these articles brings a different and I think a fresh set of insights um, on the question of how room, i.e. Greek Orthodox subjects did and did not fit into Ottoman history and alongside other communities um, and in the Ottoman empire in the 19th century. And together, 
I hope the assemblage of articles asks us to step back and rethink the questions that we ask, or at least be aware of what questions we have been asking, right? And the ways that we have become used to um, compartmentalizing non-Muslims in our imagination of Ottoman state and society. Um, we, um, why do we ask the questions that we usually ask about non-Muslims and particularly room in the 19th century? Uh, and are there new ways that we can think about how, about coexistence, which has become really a shorthand and we rush ahead with certain assumptions from that word, I think these days. So how can we think anew about coexistence to account for both the boundaries and the spaces of interaction and overlap between the communities? Um, so without further ado, I will introduce, I'll do all three introductions now, and then I'll just simply pass the baton on to each person um, to give their presentation. So our first presenter is going to be Evangelia Eva Akhladi, who has been um, <clears throat> the Library and Culture Coordinator of the Cultural Center of Greece in Istanbul at the Sismanoglio Megaro since 2012. Uh, her research interests lie in the history of Orthodox Greeks of the Ottoman Empire of the 20th century, uh, Karaman Lithika literature, Karaman Luja, uh, and some of her published studies are the Karaman Lithika periodical Actis uh, from 2014 and Karaman Lorum Orthodox Pir Askerin Seferberli Katraları Çanakkale Vedu Çepeleri uh, from 2017. Uh, and uh, Stelios Theodosiadis, My Life in Makri and Livisi from 2021, as well as um, Lycia in the 19th and 20th century press, also from 2021. Panayotis Poulos, uh, with a BA and PhD from SOAS, uh, University of London, is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology at the Department of Music Studies at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens and a member of the Ethnomusicology and Cultural Anthropology Laboratory of the same department. His research centers on the musical traditions of, uh, of the Islamic world, the cultural history of late Ottoman and Turkish music and arts with a focus on the role and status of non-Muslim communities, intercommunal relations, which he'll be talking to us about today, and the history of everyday life in Ottoman cities. Uh, Poulos is one of the founding members of the research team Sonor Cities, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, and scientific coordinator along with Elias Kolovos of the research project History, Spaces and Heritage, Heritages at the Transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Greek State, uh, and principal investigator of the research project Intercommunal Musical Geographies of Late Ottoman Istanbul, founded by the Hellenic Foundation for Research and Innovation uh, from 2019 to 2022. In 2013, he was awarded an honorable mention for the Amadouchi Barkhan Award, which I think is no longer called that, but it, the award formerly known as the Omar Lutfi Barkhan Award by the Ottoman and Turkish Studies uh, Association for his article, Rethinking Orality in Turkish Classical Music, a Genealogy of Contemporary Musical Assemblages. And last but not least, Gulen Gertürk Baltas completed, uh, completed her PhD in political science and public administration at Middle East Technical University in 2015. And she now works as an assistant professor in the political science and public administration department at Eskişehir Osman Gazi University. Uh, she's the author of Well-Preserved Boundaries, Faith and Coexistence in the Late Ottoman Empire from Rutledge in 2020. And she's published articles on Ottoman Greeks and uh, the Turkish Greek exchange of populations. So we will move on to our first presentation, which is Eva Flavi. Welcome, Eva. Hi, thank you very much, Christine. It's a great honor. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, allow me to say happy Mizei Gechmish all soon. Biyuk bir felaket yashiorus, yashadik ve yashiorus. Ve hepimiz yardımcı olmaya çalışalım bu e, zor e, şeyde, anlarda. E, şimdi, e, could I share the, I think, the presentation? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think that um, this, uh, this issue, the room, uh, room geographies, um, hopes to draw the attention to the need of integrating uh, 
the history of uh, room communities to the Ottoman history without neglecting uh, the, the self-perception of the subjects of these communities. So, although there is valuable literature in the Greek language on Istanbul room communities, many of these studies examine the history of such communities independently from the Ottoman historical framework. So, when you read some of these studies, you think that the communities of the Ottoman Greeks have lived and functioned in a Greek domain or in an in-between space, something which is definitely unhistorical. Perhaps this approach may be justified by the fact that uh, they were also, uh, these communities, the Rome communities, they were also under the jurisdiction of separate ecclesiastical administrative frameworks. Uh, on the other hand, Ottomanists who study the history of the non-Muslim communities, they also need to know Greek, Armenian, Hebrew or other languages in order to understand better the internal dynamics of these communities. Fortunately, the last decades, we have witnessed scores of such researchers with these superhero abilities who have mastered both uh, Turkish Ottoman language and, let's say, minority languages and have contributed amazing studies to the topic. So my article, Room Communities of Istanbul in the 19th and 20th Centuries, a historical uh, survey, uh, just points out some characteristics and some turning point uh, events of the long and complex history of the Istanbul room communities. And in the appendix list the names of the current uh, 45 Greek Orthodox communities of Istanbul and the functioning uh, churches. So Istanbul is a huge urban conglomerate with neighborhoods spreading out across great distances established at different times by population of diverse origins. So Istanbul room communities shared the same characteristics. They were dynamic with highly mobile populations and the boundaries of communities have changed over time for a variety of reasons, including population increase, uh, natural disasters, as well as political changes. So Istanbul room communities were founded at different periods uh, from the time of the Ottoman conquest through to the empire sent in the early 20th century. As a result of the Ottoman Empire's policy after the conquest of repopulating the semi-deserted Istanbul, many Christians from other provinces of the empire came to the capital city. Thus, we could say that the room population of Istanbul was composed mostly of people who came to the city as migrants from different parts of the empire and established their own communities. Uh, however, many communities were established in the late period, after the Greek, even after the Greek Revolution of 1821. So, uh, in one of the oldest censuses, in the 1592 census, non-Muslims were split into one of six groups, Greeks, Armenians, Jews, Karamanites, Europeans, and Greeks from Galata. We see that Christian rooms are registered under three categories, Rumlar, uh, Greeks, Orthodox Greeks, Karamandan Gelen Christian Lar, Christians from Karamania, from Cappadocia, uh, Galata Friendly River Rumlar, rooms of Galata. So the, the Turk of an Orthodox from Cappadocia, Karamanites, who were settled in some of the oldest districts along the walls, like <laughs> and they were considered to be a distinct group within the room millet, distinct from the rooms of Galata, where a topographic definition is used to refer primarily to Catholic Greeks. This classification demonstrates not only the different origins of the Greek Orthodox population, but also the different way they were viewed by the Ottoman state. Now, in Istanbul population registers from the uh, 19th and 20th centuries, the non-Muslims are grouped like the Muslims in two main categories, married, mutehil, and unmarried, bekaran, bekar and distributed according to different poll tax levels. So this category, the category of Bekar, 
namely non-married artisans who had migrated uh, to Istanbul to seek employment, was for a long period an important classification category of the Orthodox Greek population as well. According to the census conducted in 1835, half of the non-Muslim male population of uh, Istanbul and the Thib borough, uh, Ayyub Galatine Ishkudar, were uh, bekars, were single, unmarried. So this category, the category of bekar, was directly connected to the guild system and often members of a guild, in addition to practicing the same profession, came from the same region. Certain guilds were patrons of churches, such was the case of the Church of St. John in Galata, known also as St. John of the Church. And in, uh, in general, the construction, destruction and restoration of churches obviously bear witness to the history of the Greek Orthodox communities. Of course, the question of urban geography and demography of room communities of Istanbul cannot be separated from the political life, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. A turning point event in the political life of the empire, of uh, the uh, Istanbul room communities, was the 1821 Greek Revolution, which marked the end of the Fanariot's political power. So after the reprisals that followed the revolution, the district of Stavrodromi, Tera, today Beyoglu, provided a shelter for Christians. Fanar remained the center of religious authority, but the economic and cultural center of room life shifted to Pera, to Beyoglu. In the following years, members of the ascending bourgeois, upper middle and middle classes settled in Beyoglu in Stavrodromi, as did many migrants from the islands of the Aegean, Macedonia, Albania and Anatolia, especially after 1840s. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, Stavrodromi, Pera, Beyoglu and Galata would constitute the financial centers in the communal life of the Greeks of Constantinople, as well as the cultural centers. The affluence and the degree of organization of the Stavrodromi uh, uh, Bay of the community is reflected in the churches and schools and large number of philanthropic, educational and cultural associations. The Silogi. So another, uh, uh, another turning point uh, event was the legal uh, codification uh, was the legal codification of the administration of the room communities, which took place in the context of the Tanzimat reforms. So in the 1870s, uh, the room Ileti produced the general regulations, Yenikus Kanonismus, which were recognized by the Ottoman government as laws of the state. The Greek Orthodox communities would each publish their own statutes, Nizamaname, codifying older uh, customs. However, different forms of communal uh, organization, whether professional guilds, parishes and school boards or communal societies, preceded the composition of the community statutes. So the Greek Orthodox communities uh, um, uh, in the, in the 1870s, here, just to, to stop, to, you see some of the oldest um, communal societies in the districts of Galata and Fanar, Fener. From the 1870s onward, there is an impressive increase in the number of professional, educational and charitable associations, the Silogi movement, in all Istanbul communities. So the great number of hometown uh, societies, educational or charitable societies, bear witness to the migrant trends from certain areas of the Ottoman Empire to Istanbul, as well as to the metropolitan role of the city as a religious and cultural center, not only of the Greeks of Istanbul, but of the entire Orthodox Greek subjects of the empire. Here we see some of the uh, communities established in the late period after the Greek Revolution, like Yenima Hale or uh, Boyajikiri. 
So the Roma communities of Istanbul were never united in one community with a single administration. All communities were subject to the already existing administrative bodies of the church, such as the Archbishopric of Constantinople and the metropolises of Chalcedon and uh, Turkey. So the parishes of the center of the city, main Istanbul, were under the jurisdiction of the Archbishopric of Constantinople, which in 1897 included 42 parishes. The metropolis of Chalcedon, or in the eastern side of Bosporus, included 35 communities, uh, as well as the communities in the Princess Islands. After the exchange of population, the Princess Islands were organized as a separate metropolis, and 22 communities of the metropolis of Chalcedon were forced to migrate to Greece. In the same way, the metropolis of Derki included 41 communities in the eastern side of Bosporus, but following 1924 and the exchange of populations between Greece and Turkey, the migration of many parishioners to Greece, the jurisdiction of the metropolis was limited to only five communities. Yes, and I think I, I leave it here to you know to have to leave to give time to other speakers and maybe we can have some yes. questions later. Thank you so much, Eva. Now we move on to Panayotis. All right, can you uh, see my PowerPoint presentation, first slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon to, to all of you. I should start by saying that uh, uh, my thought and heart is with uh, the people suffering uh, both in Turkey and uh, Syria these days uh, following the uh, disastrous earthquakes. I should uh, also thank, uh, first of all, Christine Filiou for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, Georgia special issue, which was a very productive uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the editorial team started with Heather Ferguson and um, also David Gutman, uh, uh, his particular help at, uh, during the editorial uh, uh, stage of the article. Um, I would uh, present a summary of my article, and I would like to start by saying that this is uh, mainly research that uh, is based, uh, was conducted uh, as part of the uh, research project I'm, uh, I've been directing here in uh, here at the University of Athens. Uh, it is the, the project is called the Communal Musical Geographies of Late Ottoman Istanbul. Uh, it's a, a project, interdisciplinary project hosted at the Ethnomusicology and Cultural Anthropology Laboratory of the Music Department of the National uh, Capodistrian University of Athens. And it's been uh, funded by the Hellenic Foundation for Research the Innovation. Very briefly, uh, the project uh, focuses on the various ways of uh, intercommunal musical interaction. Uh, both uh, in late Ottoman Istanbul, both in uh, sort of formal context, but also uh, informal context. And the whole idea is to try to uh, study these relationships and map them uh, and uh, see what space and spatial, spatial analysis can offer in our understanding of uh, music history. Uh, Part of the deliverables is uh, what you see here. It's, uh, it's a digital repository where we actually uh, include all the material analyzed, both from Ottoman and Greek um, uh, archival sources, printed music collections, Greek and Ottoman uh, press, just to, to mention the, the, the main sources. And uh, this can actually work as a kind of a repository of uh, material, uh, uh, specific uh, um, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, context of events, of a musical uh, interaction, but also uh, as an archive of uh, musical collections and their content, and also the mapping of the various um, 
uh, occasions of music making. Uh, this will be soon uh, open to the public, so I will invite you to to to follow the follow us and uh, make use of uh, what we've been working for the past uh, two three years. And uh, I would straight move ahead to uh, my uh, presentation, to my contribution to, to the Georgia Special Issue. Uh, Greeks and Jews in Istanbul in the late Ottoman era, but also in earlier times, I think, do not seem to share much in terms of uh, uh, their social the social lives of their communities. On the contrary, suspicion and hostility are seen in uh, various uh, cases of uh, blood libel incidents reported in the second half of the 19th century prevailed over productive with the communal uh, interaction. In my research, I find it really challenging to explore the ways in which the study of music related practices might offer a complementary or even an alternative view of intercommunal relations in the context of late Ottoman Empire. By that, of course, I do not uh, endorse uh, the idealized image of carefree coexistence full of lively entertainment and prosperity. Rather, I seek to gain access to aspects of the social life of uh, non-Muslim subjects in their interaction among their communities and with the Ottoman state. Uh, and all that will inform our understanding of major social, political, and cultural processes at work in the 19th century. An important sociopolitical field in which uh, the Greek and uh, Jewish communities appear also segregated and with almost non-existent uh, interaction or common vision is that of uh, music uh, modernization process. By music modernization process, I refer here to the response either by the state or by the different communities to the call for change and reform uh, in uh, music, as, uh, in music uh, um, associated with uh, the politics of uh, the Tanzimat and post-Tanzimat era. Traditional music uh, scholarship holds the view that uh, music modernization was a centralized top-down process and identified its sources almost exclusively in uh, Western uh, models and institutions. As opposed to that, in my research, uh, modernization is understood uh, here to have been a multi-sided urban process whereby the Ottoman state and other agents, members of the non-Muslim communities included, participated and interacted with each other. Uh, of course, this, is, uh, this work has been informed by other works by scholars like Walter Feldman and Ornur Gunes Ayas on the music, Ottoman music modernity, but also scholars following a, a special term in the study of Ottoman music, like the uh, recent work by uh, Onur Oner. In pinning down the spatial dimension of music modernization process, one needs to move away from the stereotypical idea that Ottoman music was modernized only by the adoption of Western-like melodies and performance manners, and instead focus on the initiatives led by communal literate elites, the emergence of new forms of public sociality, and the renewal and expansion of the field of uh, music entertainment. For instance, uh, music modernization in initiatives were interwined with the establishment and advancement of uh, print music, which contributed significant to the wider dissemination of ideas on the reform and systematization of music theory and the facilitation of uh, musical uh, notation systems. This development overlapped with the field of uh, public uh, sociality as it provided new venues within the city, like printing houses and uh, bookshops that functioned, functioned as meeting points for musicians and music aficionados and hosted activities centered around the new manifestations of music. Uh, as an illustration of this, uh, I would like to mention that the first two pre Greek printed music collections of Ottoman secular repertoire, namely Ftepia uh, Pandora, you see at the slides, uh, produced in 1830s and 1846 respectively, were printed in the printed house of the uh, Jew printer Isaac de Castro in Galata. Uh, Isaac de Castro uh, was the printer of a sizable number of uh, music books of Greek Orthodox church music notated in the reformed notation system. What followed this uh, publication was the emergence of musical gatherings in shops 
and here is one slide from my, our repository, where holders, holders of the books could actually gather together and be, be instructed in the new sort of musical method. The above mentioned new forms of sociality develop alongside older uh, ones, such as private house gatherings, music nightclubs, mayhanes and gazinos, and later in the second half of the 19th century, social clubs and uh, voluntary associations that Eva have been talking uh, about uh, in her presentation. All these uh, manifestations of communal public musical activity, although highly diverse in social terms, formed a dense network of locales in the city of Istanbul. Within these spaces, non-Muslims participated with their own means in the production and negotiation of Ottoman music modernity. In my article, I chose to explore further this den net dense network of locales by focusing on the interreligiously mixed districts along the Golden Horn, namely Djimbalu, Balat, and Hashkiri. This choice of geographical focus offers, as I argued, a decentralized view of uh, the music modernization process, both uh, in spatial and political uh, terms. Now, in spatial terms, this choice undermines the identification of Ottoman music modernization with the westernized social life of uh, Beyoglu and its uh, precincts as it has been uh, very widely port portrayed and represented. Now, in political terms, this geographical choice acknowledges the local agents and processes related to the Greeks and Jewish communities that have been operating as part of uh, urban networks throughout the 19th century and that were entangled in the wider music modernization, modernization process uh, than has been previously thought. In addition, I should add that the modest social and economic profile of parts of the area studied uh, contributes to, an, to the knowledge of social stratification of non-Muslim communities and constitutes a challenge to the study of intercommunal relations, relations overall. I will close the summary of my uh, article uh, with a specific example feature uh, in my research. A, the list of subscribers of the second edition of the music collection Musicona Panthisma by Ioannis uh, Zografos, published in 1872, includes both the right and left side cantors of the Church of Hagia Parascevi, the principal Orthodox uh, parish of Hashkui, namely Andreas Kamilis and uh, Georgios Ioannidis. Being in the list of subscribers, both financially supported in advance the publication of Ottoman urban secular music featured in this collection. As seen in the accounted books of uh, the Church of Hagia Paraskevi, in order for them to pay for the copies of this music collection, church cantors like Andreas Camillis and uh, Yorgos Ioannidis partly relied on the rental income of the Church of Hagia Paraskevi and its Jewish tenants. So among the premises rented were also uh, places associated with music entertainment that thrived, uh, as we'll see in the article in the area, like, for instance, this Capillo, uh, Meihane, uh, that was rented by a certain uh, Israel uh, in, uh, nine, in uh, uh, 1900. This observation offers a glimpse into the intercommunal economy behind the musical life of Istanbul in the late Ottoman era. This type of financial network between members of the two communities operates, operated against the backdrop of uh, the music modernizing process, yet they were embedded elements of the quotidian life of districts like Hashkiri. Overall, uh, in my article, I examined the different registers of music interaction between Greek Orthodox and Jewish communities of Istanbul in the late Ottoman period. I situated this interaction within the broader framework of uh, modernization of music. And I argued that uh, new forms of sociality in which members of the two communities were involved produced intercommunal collective identities that were constituted in a dialectic manner to the modernizing initiatives by the state and Ottoman modernity overall. By putting forth a special approach to music, to Ottoman music modernization, I attempted to challenge the centralized narratives concerning the modernization of Ottoman music and to highlight the important role of local intermediaries and new economic, economic patterns in shaping Ottoman uh, musical modernity. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Panayotis. And now we move on to Gulen. Welcome. Herkese iyi akşamlar. Ee, tabii ben Türkiye'den katıldığım için iyi akşamlar diyorum. Belki de iyi günler demem daha doğru olur. Ee, burada tabii çok zor günlerden geçiyoruz. Ee, yani büyük bir travma yaşıyoruz. Destek mesajlarınız için hepinize teşekkür ederim. Ee, hemen paylaşım yapayım. You see my um, PowerPoint presentation? Okay, before uh, starting, I would like to thank Kristin Filiu uh, for inviting me to write in room geographies and to Eva Ahladi because she recommended me and to um, Baki Tezcan for this evening, uh, for this meeting. Um, my article uh, does not focus on room communities of Istanbul but uh, it somehow touches upon uh, Cappadocian immigrants in Istanbul. So um, it discusses a broader geography and the connection between immigrant men in Istanbul and their left behind wives in Cappadocia. Uh, and um, my article is from a female perspective, which has been long absent in uh, historiography because I am presenting female songs in my uh, article. In uh, 2012 and 13, uh, I was conducting research for my dissertation in the oral tradition archive at the Center for Asia Minor Studies. And uh, there I came across many song lyrics uh, in Turkish in Cappadocia folders. Many of these lyrics were about gurbet. Um, it was so because in the 19th century, a substantial proportion of the Orthodox Christian male population of Cappadocia migrated to coastal areas, financial centers, overseas, and mainly to Istanbul. Um, Gurbet means a place uh, far from where one was born. It also means being separate and distant as well as foreignness and exile. So it does not simply refer to foreign lands, but it is an emotionally loaded word and refers to the state of being in a foreign land. Uh, some of the lyrics of these uh, songs I found in the archive were familiar to me because I know some uh, Turkish, some folk songs uh, with the same or similar wording but some of them were not very familiar to me. Of course, I am neither a musicologist, and I must admit that not a great fan of uh, folk music, but I realized that some of these lyrics might have had the same melody. Um, so they might have been a variation of the same songs. Um, I'm not an expert on Turkish folk music. Um, I, don't, I don't know, an expert might find out, but I was more interested in the content of these lyrics because they were reflecting female uh, emotions about an important phenomenon, immigration at the time. And I collected all these songs from different folders of Cappadocia uh, at the um, Center for Asia Minor Studies. Um, how can I change it? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, the lyrics of the six songs uh, I share uh, in my article are uh, clearly sung from uh, the perspective of a migrant's wife, because in four of them, the husband is addressed as Aam. What does Aam mean? It literally means my lord, but it is also a colloquial way of saying my husband in Turkish. So um, this suggests that these songs do not show the perspective of another female figure, but wives. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, of course, in addition to Cappadocia, migration was commonplace among the Greek Orthodox populations in Epirus, Macedonia, Peloponnese, and Central Greece as well. Um, in mainland Greece, uh, men began to immigrate to Wallachia, Moldavia, Transylvania, and the Habsburg Empire out of uh, financial necessity. 
Also in these areas, women produced similar, uh, similar songs in the Greek language. Uh, and these songs are like the folk song traditions of Cappadocia. Uh, I also in my article share such songs with the same content from these areas. Um, in Greek folklore, there are two types of songs uh, that deal with the theme of expatriation, or as we call gurbet in Turkish. Uh, these are the songs of the expatriate uh, and the songs of the expatriate, expatriate's wife. Uh, I adopted this term uh, from Guy Michel Sonier and called these songs the songs of the expatriate's wife because as I said, the six songs lyrics are from the perspective of wives. Um, these songs were in Turkish, but not in Greek. Uh, one might wonder why they are uh, not in Greek, but in Turkish, because in Cappadocia, uh, most of the villages uh, were predominantly Turkish speaking. Uh, there were a few Greek speaking villages, uh, but in such villages, the number of Greek, uh, how can I say, Greek speaking people declined in time because of immigration to uh, foreign lands, to Gurbet. Uh, before these migrations, uh, we don't see women in public sphere and they could survive without speaking Turkish in these Greek speaking villages. And men would navigate the market, uh, daily marketplace encounters with the Turks. When men began to migrate, uh, women inevitably became more visible in the public sphere. They learned Turkish and they eventually taught it to their children. Uh, another question to be asked, why did the Cappadocians migrate? Um, almost all Center for Asia Minor Studies uh, interviewees um, cited scarcity of resources, and lack of trading opportunities in Cappadocia as the reasons for their uh, migration. Uh, however, in the 19th century, these push factors declined and there were some pull factors uh, stemming from the economic advance advancement in the empire's coastal regions. Uh, and for the first time, a physical and organic bond emerged and tied migrants firmly to their homelands, facilitated by the construction of railroads and other modern transportation networks. And during this period, uh, Cappadocian migrants primarily traveled to financial centers of Asia Minor, which were close to railroads like Ankara, Eskishehir. Uh, the urban centers of empire's coastal regions like Izmir, Izmir, Istanbul, and also locations outside the Ottoman Empire, Alexandria, Cairo, Athens, America. The songs I share in my article refer mainly to Istanbul as a gurbet place. Uh, in the early years of migration, migrants would not, would not take their family with them. Uh, upon finishing elementary school, mostly, uh, many young men would live, uh, live with their fathers, relatives, or other compatriots. When they were old enough to get married, they would write a letter to their parents to let them know of their intention to marry. After getting married, they would once again leave. Depending on the distance between, between their homeland and destination, the expatriates would occasionally return to visit them. Uh, the Cappadocian bride could not choose her husband, like in many other uh, places of Anatolia, of course, and it was valid for the Muslim woman as well. She could not voice her disapproval when her husband decided to migrate. Uh, when men left their, their hometowns, women were tasked with the responsibility of looking after children, the elderly, and of course they assumed more roles uh, in the daily functioning of the village. Uh, there were also uh, inconsiderate exploitative in-laws, which also increased their workload. 
the lyrics um, I uh, presented in my article reflect that these songs were intended as a protest against the migration of men and as a means to relieve the grief brought on by their departure. A common feature of these songs is that they depict the innocence of women and the image of women as wronged victims in the face of the evils of group absence, risk of death, and the cold attitude of the husband when he returns home. Uh, of course, I don't have time to share all these six songs in this presentation, uh, but uh, I will, uh, if you let me, I will read in Turkish one of these uh, songs, and it uh, refers directly to Istanbul as a Gurbet place. Uh, you can see the uh, English translation of the song, but I will read it, uh, if I may, in Turkish. İstanbul yoluna diktim gözümü, bir yiğit uğruna verdim özümü. İstanbul, İstanbul, viran galasın, taşın toprağın seller alsın. Ne ettim gurbet sana, ne ettim ne eyledin. Çifte zincir ile yolumu bağladın. İstanbul yoluna kuş kader kader, eşinden ayrılmış bir keklik öter. Eşinden ayrılması ölümden beter. Tez gel ağam. Tez gel, gayrı dardayım. Ağam gönderdiğin yazmayı yaktım. Kül ettim ömrümü, yoluna baktım. Ağam İstanbul'da sen evli misin? Sıla'ya gelmeye yeminli misin? Tez gel soysuz, tez gel ağlatma beni. İki elim koynumda, gözletme beni. Dalma ağam dalma, sular derindir. Yolunu bekleyen cahil gelindir. Bu yılda gelmezsen Mevla Kerim'dir. Tez gel ağam, tez gel ağlatma beni. In this song we see that she curses Istanbul. She is angry, she is sad, she feels lonely, she, she is jealous, she is inquisitive, she wonders if he, if he may have remade, uh, remarried while in Istanbul. And she even implicitly threatens her husband of divorce. So many feelings together in one song, extreme pain, stress, and anger. The song also implies that expatriation of her husband was something decided prior to their marriage, because she says here, uh, so uh, I think, uh, probably uh, her husband expatriated before they got married. Uh, these anonymous folk songs, uh, as we call them Türkü in Turkish, uh, continue to be sung uh, by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And I think they are products of all Anatolians. Um, I consider them universal products because no matter who created them in the first place, they show the feelings of those in the Turkish speaking world who uh, find themselves in similar positions to those who first sang them. Uh, of course, uh, internal and international migration continues to be a commonplace phenomenon in the Republican era Turkey, beginning from the 1950s. Uh, migrants and the left behind people relieved and relieve their sorrow with these gurbet turkuleri, with these um, uh, gurbet songs. So uh, all in all, um, these songs are important, I think, for two reasons. First, they give voice to otherwise silent historical actors, the women. In the end, immigrant men in Istanbul and elsewhere left behind a silent crowd, and we hear their voices through these songs. And second, women with similar experiences, even today, lament their misfortune with these songs in the Turkish speaking world. And of course, these, these songs belong to a category of Greek songs, the songs of the expatriate's wife, which we see in other parts of the Greek world as well. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um,
We'll open the floor for questions. Yes, <laughs> applause for, thank you all. Um, so many common themes are coming, even more than I thought when I saw the whole thing in writing. Um, so just to lay a few out there and maybe stimulate some questions, the themes of music and song, of course, between Panos and Gulen's uh, presentations, mobility and migration runs across all of this. We are talking about geographies after all, so that makes a lot of sense. Also this theme of, um, whether um, the, the Karaman Le as both unique in some ways and set off like in the 16th century census that Eva mentioned set off as a separate group and the ways in which they have so much in common with Turkophone Muslims going through the same experience in that region. Um, and um, yeah, I think maybe we have some questions. I just, I had some I could ask, but here's two great from Dr. Pam Sezgin. Uh, the first is for Eva. Was there contact between the Hyotes in Istanbul with the Greeks from Hios who converted to Islam like um, the elite ones like Osman Hamdi Bey? And it's two questions, but I think maybe she's gonna write the second one after. So this is for Eva for now. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I, don't, I don't have an answer. <laughs> if someone can help, it's, no, I, I have not, uh, I, I haven't read something I guess that there was contact, but um, yeah. I think we're still putting the pieces together on that question. That's a great question. And I have come across a few pieces here and there, but I haven't yet, I, I don't know, maybe you guys have, but I haven't yet found um, indisputable evidence that there was ongoing contact. Uh, okay, second question for Panos. Did the room musicians in Istanbul um, at the Mevlevi Teke, okay, I'm not sure where the question is. Did the Oh, did the room musicians play at the Mevlevi Teke? The Jews uh, performed music there. I'm not sure which part of that is the question, which is the statement, yes. but maybe you know. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, we we we have more uh, clearly documented presence of Greek uh, cantors and actually cantors from the Patriarchate to the Mevlevi Hane of uh, Galata in the 18th century. So this is more sort of uh, well documented but uh, not as far as I'm aware uh, in the 19th century, although it doesn't mean that uh, this trend didn't uh, continue. Uh, we certainly know more about the close relationship between uh, the Jewish uh, cantors uh, and the and the Mevlevi. So th there has been, there is a tradition of uh, Greek cantors going to the uh, Mevlevi Hane and, and uh, playing with uh, Mevlevi musicians, uh, but uh, I haven't sort of documented the, the phenomenon in the 19th century. Okay. Uh, Baki, is that a hand up? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to ask a, a quick question to Eva. Uh, Eva, uh, you mentioned the Greek communities of Istanbul. Most of them actually originate from 1821 onwards. And that I, because I have no idea, it's not something I studied. I found that surprising uh, because I assumed, yes, the city was depopulated at the conquest, but afterwards there were people who came from different parts of the empire and there would have been Greek communities. Uh, and of course there were, I imagine, but then what happened to the ones that were there before 1821? Did they, because what, why is it that 18, after 1821, more communities emerged? Is, is there an explanation for that? I didn't say exactly that, but I see that there are a number of communities, not most communities, that they were uh, founded after uh, after 1821. I mean, like the uh, some of the communities that uh, I presented, Yenima Khale, Boyajikui. Uh, not uh, not that they are the majority of the communities were founded after, but there is, uh, I mean, after the Greek Revolution and uh, the reprisals of the first uh, years, there is after, I think, because I'm not an expert of the, the period, I think that after uh, 1830s, uh, 40s, there is a revival. There are, there are new migrations, trends from... Um, from Rumeli, from European parts of the empire to Istanbul. 
yeah. and specific groups. Maybe, Christine, can yeah. you contribute? We're in process of tracking all of that, and we'll be able to tell you in about 20 years, I think. <laughs> There's a lot of material, but um, yes, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, I, I think, to, sorry, oh. I think I just wanted to point out, to how, it, um, I think in Eva's article, it comes out more clearly because she has more space to develop it. But when communities, meaning commune, like a administratively organized community, not necessarily just like a group of people informally organized. So I think a lot of that did happen after the 1820s in terms of like conscious administrative organization and that also we're kind of trying to track um and there's a lot happening <laughs> in that early 19th century so yeah oh oh i, I see you. so there's also the uh a certain degree of modern organization involved uh, that didn't exist before it's not that every community is new but uh, the way in which they're organized and get together is new i understand that's, exactly that's very helpful yes. thank you yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I had a quick question to Gulen. Uh, were you able at all to find the music to any one of these songs that were written in lyric? <laughs> Is it possible? Uh, if are there recordings? I mean, I imagine there aren't because they. Uh, but but still, uh, could, would it be worthwhile to look into archives to find musical archives? That is to see mm -hmm. whether you could locate any actual music to any of the lyrics. Uh, only Gesi Bağları, of course, it's a very well known song uh, in Turkish, uh, in Turkey. Uh, actually, I met a group of people in Yuanina and they were singing uh, the song as Keçi Bağları with the same wording I found in the archive. But mm -hmm. actually in Turkey, uh, we don't use the same wording because we standardized all these uh, folk songs through TRT. Uh, there is a, a website called Repair to Kül. Uh, they are collecting folk songs in that website. Mm -hmm. I looked for them in that website, but I couldn't find them. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so this well-known song is actually, was actually sung by uh, Orthodox Greek Turkish speakers. Yes, speaker. yes. And today, okay. nowadays, nowadays in their village, actually they are, they use them as a lament song. And uh, when they're mourning, when they have funeral, they sing Gesi Bağları. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> We probably have time for one more question if anyone has. I mean, I have a big question <laughs> that is sort of, oh, wait, Vanessa has a question. Yes. Do you want to unmute Vanessa Dale Baldia? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank the presenters for their fascinating uh, interventions and also to the organizers. Um, I have uh, one um, minor question that is for Eva. It's lovely to see you again, Eva. Um, <laughs> and that's about the um, slide that you presented regarding the 1592 census. Uh, in it, you described um, or you defined the the term uh, Franklere, Galata Franklere, as rooms of Galata and um or um catholic greeks so i was just interested to know why mm -hmm. you defined the term as such because um in uh, many of the ottoman documents i've been dealing with uh the term Fra frank or frank letter refers to the latin catholic um communities of galata mm -hmm. and pera hi vanessa thank you for the question no, I didn't uh, interpret it the term. The description is Galata uh, Frenklery ve Rumlare. That is to get mm. both. Of course, Frank is, uh, is uh, we know that is, uh, is referring to more Levantine of Levantine origin. But here is Galata Rumlare. So it's a topographical uh, um, definition of Greeks of Galata that we we know we have the information that they were mostly of Catholic uh, Catholics not Orthodox but of course Frank and Rum is uh, we have both terms Galata Frank Clery Verum Lare is different 
Sorry for that. Sorry. Thank you very much for your... It was my <laughs> my fault, the way that I read it, probably. <laughs> oh, my, my misunderstanding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. I think we're out of time. Are we not, Baki? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, we are at the end of our hour, and, and I really, really appreciate all of the presentations and also the questions. If uh, there is a last question somewhere, is this possible? But if not, uh, this is just right. This is exactly what we <laughs> envisioned these meetings to last so that people could take their lunches and then within an hour get going, ask their questions and go and do it very regularly. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much for the presentations, questions, for your articles of the presenters to the journal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please consider joining us next Friday on the talk about the earthquake. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so thank much. You thank you, much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Yes. Thank Bye -bye. you. Gilan. It was great to meet you. Thank you. Bye.